empathy and compassion is actionable, right? It's not just feeling bad for someone, it's actionable, it's wanting to do something. Negative self-judgment is the worst thing you can do. I understand for anyone listening, there are times in our life where money has to be the motivator because we need security, we need stability. But when you do it intentionally, at least then you don't expect that thing to bring you the greatest happiness because you know what purpose it's serving in your life. For me, my plea to all of you and to myself is whatever we're gonna do, let's get really strategic about it. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. Top 10, I got a top 10. Got my motivation high for my top 10. Gotta learn from the wise women and men. All my life. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael and I make these videos because chances are you are the most ambitious person in your circle, but you know you're capable of more and you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today let's learn from one of the best, Jay Shetty and my take on his top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. Okay, let's kick it off with rule number one, have empathy. The first thing I want you to believe is whenever you feel an emotion that you don't like about yourself, whether it's greed, anger, envy, ego, whatever it may be, first thing I want you to recognize is that it's like having a bad friend in your room that's really close to you. It's a friend who's going through some troubles, right? That's what it is. It's not you. It's like having someone else in the room who's having those experiences. And with that person, one of the things you want to do is start with Compassion, if your friend was envious of someone else, you'd feel compassionate for them, you'd feel bad for them, you wanna help them, right? Empathetic, not just sympathetic, but empathetic. Empathy and compassion is actionable, right? It's not just feeling bad for someone, it's actionable, it's wanting to do something. Negative self-judgment is the worst thing you can do. Rule number two, reflect on your intentions. I do feel that it's my responsibility to get my intentions right. And so one of my biggest visualizations that I do do in the morning is I, so I believe that good intentions in our life are seeds and bad intentions are weeds. And so what it's I- Seeds and weeds seeds system. Seeds and weeds. Good, and every good. single day- See what why I, he's getting the followers. <laughs> he's going to get the likes with the seeds and weeds. Every- That's, that's very Snoop. It's very Snoop. Yeah. 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 Okay. So different different yeah. seeds and yeah, different yeah. weeds. Different seeds. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. I, I like that. Yeah. Thanks, mate. Go on. Yeah. Uh, no. So I was saying, so what I do is I reflect on my intentions visually every day. And I think about how many deals am I taking just because they make me money? Or how many videos am I making just because they get me views? Or how much stuff am I doing just for the vanity or just for the fame or success or what I think is, is going to be good for me, like financially, economic, like how the, how the default mind is set up to think about security as opposed to love and compassion and wanting to change the world and wanting to make a different place. And I'm constantly battling with the two. So what I'll do every day is I'll reflect on my intentions. I'll reflect on the deals I've just signed. I'll reflect on uh, things I'm being offered. And I'll literally look at each offer, deal, whatever it is, each item of thought. And I'll say, is that a seed or a weed? And if it's a weed, I'll pluck it out. I'll literally visualize myself plucking it out of the, the garden of my mind and pulling it out and taking it out. And if it's a seed, then I'll water it. And I'll say, okay, I want that to grow because I am doing that for the right intention. Rule number three, don't rush through pain. When you can be trusted with the small things and the small moments, you get trusted with more and more and more. And so like, it helps to just, in that moment, and it's in those painful moments that you realize how powerful you are. We all know that, like you really yes. recognize it. And, and what you said was beautiful about not rushing through the pain because, and, and you know, I, I, this example's probably been shared before, but if you have a wound and you've cut yourself, it's like you can't rush the healing. You can't rush it. If you broke your arm, I mean, and you've been through so many bodily yes. injuries, you can't rush the process. It's gonna take six weeks minimum to heal a broken Correct. bar. Yeah, Correct. minimum. And you've gotta sit through that. It's painful. You, there's no injections you can take, there's no videos you can watch, there's nothing you can listen to. But our challenge is we try and rush through the pain yeah. rather than reflect through the pain. We try to rush the healing process. We try to too. rush the healing, and you can't rush healing. And healing is meant to be slow because it buys you time, it buys you reflection, it gives you so much space to slow down. To slow down. And that's what your body is calling out for. And this is our emergency. Like, how many times have you heard it where you slow down, you slow down, and that's when you fall ill? 
Because guess what? Your body has been trying to tell you to slow, slow down. down yeah. When you feel pain, so I, I write about it and think like a monk, pain makes you pay attention. Yeah. That's what pain's for. Pain's notice not- Notice this. Notice this. Look notice at me. Notice me, look yeah. at me. It's, cra- it's like a crying baby craving yeah. for attention. When a baby's crying, you don't just go, ah, oh, it's crying. <laughs> you don't just go, oh yeah, we'll just put it in another room and forget about it, right? <laughs> like you go to it and you find its needs. Whereas without pain, when something's painful, we're just like, oh yeah, I'll just forget about it. I'll escape from it, I'll do something else. Yeah. You have to go into I'll that pain. It. I'll numb the pain. I'll numb the pain, With that's alcohol it. alcohol or whatever. Yeah. Hundred percent. That's that's usually our response. Is what can I do to numb this? Work more, have sex more, drink more, whatever. drugs more, whatever it is. Rather than let me actually become alert. And guess what? The pain just gets higher and mm-hmm. higher and higher and higher because unfortunately, until it really hurts, we don't stop. And, or you need more and more to numb it with. So true. Rule number four: Have compassion. A lot of people find their passion through pain. They find it through pain that they went through, pain of someone that they loved and lost pain of someone who went through a physical ailment in their life or something that they went through, and then that becomes their passion, that they've seen the worst horrific type of pain and they never want to see it again, and that becomes what illuminates their passion to them. Mm. And so compassion is another way, and actually sometimes a simpler way, because we all know what pain we don't want to feel again, and we all know what pain we don't want someone else to feel again. Hey everyone, I have been reading a bit from my friend's book, Evan Carmichael, Built to Serve, and I wanted to share this with you. So, according to a study by Carnegie Mellon University, people with supportive spouses are more likely to give themselves the chance to succeed. They studied 163 married couples and found that people with supportive spouses were more likely to take on potentially rewarding challenges. Those who accepted challenges experienced more personal growth, happiness, and psychological well-being. Now, I can truly say that I've experienced that in my life. When I first met my wife, I was just starting out. I had never released a video. I hadn't created any content. And she was such an important part of feeling supported on that journey. So whether you're in a relationship, whether you're dating, whether you're married, or even if you're single, being supported by friends and a strong community is important. Uh, Build to Serve by Ellen Carmichael, great book on how you can find your purpose and also on reminding us that we can all make a difference in the world. Thanks, Evan. Rule number five, be strategic. How many of you spend a lot of your days multitasking? Okay, good. So a lot of us spend our time multitasking. Now studies show that only 2% of us are actually able to multitask. And when most people hear that, they're like, yeah, I'm in that 2%. (laughs) That's me, right? I'm in that 2%. Uh, You're probably not, I'm not, because it's only 2% of the global population of the world. Multitasking is a myth. And I find that as spiritual activists, as conscious change makers, as change agents of the world, whatever you want to call yourself, All of us, one of the biggest mistakes we've seen, and this was the quote that I shared and a thought from Martin Luther King that I've really held close to me, is he said, those who love peace need to learn to organize themselves as well as those who love war, Mm -hmm. right? Those who love peace need to learn to organize themselves as well as those who love war, i.e. people who are trying to build destruction in the world and distractions in the world are highly organized, highly focused, highly data-oriented, highly strategic, highly process-driven. And so we have to be the same. And when you spend time with Vision, or you spend time with the Mind Valley team, you realize their success is intuitive, it is deep, it is full of love, but it is also highly strategic, it is also highly focused, and therefore it's effective. And so for me, my plea to all of you and to myself is whatever we're gonna do, let's get really strategic about it. Let's bring sincerity and strategy together. Let's bring data and dynamism together. Let's bring intuition and insight together, right? Let's not let's not look beyond that and think, oh, that stuff's going to work out because I intent my intention's nice, right? Your intention's not going to run a mile, but it will help you run the marathon. But it's not going to run that mile that you need to do right now. And so, for me, intention and action, intention and attention, both of them are required. And so my recommendation is whatever your dream is, whatever you're inspired by, whatever you think is going to have a positive impact on the world, bring both to that, right? Don't settle for one or the other. Rule number six, define your why. 
I usually write down each option that I have in life. And I think we all have different options in life. And then I'll place a word above it that feels like the right emotion. So either it can be fame. I could be doing something just because of ego and fame. I could be doing something out of love. I could be doing something for money and stability. I could be doing something for, uh, for inspiration and passion. So I try and define why... It's defining that why, that intention behind mm. it. Like, why would I take that extra flight off to mm. Singapore? Oh, because I'm going to make X amount of money, right? Like, and, and, and literally, when you look at your life weed. like that, yeah, or like, yeah, there you go. And, and then I'd be like, okay, that's a weed. Now, can I transform it into a seed? Is there a way for me to make it more intentional, purposeful, and conscious? If I can, that's amazing. I'll do that. But if I can't, I, I need to stop taking things like that into my life. And now I understand for anyone listening, there are times in our life where money has to be the motivator because we need security, we need stability. But when you do it intentionally, at least then you don't expect that thing to bring you the greatest happiness because you know what purpose it's serving in your life. So I know a lot of people who'd love to quit their jobs and live their passion. But I'm like, no, but you know why, if you know why you're doing the job you're doing, you won't expect it to make mm, you happy. Mm, you know what it excellent, serves, excellent. right? What role it serves excellent. in your life. Rule number seven, look inwards. In um, shamanism, we have this viewpoint that spirituality is not separate from life. It's, it, it means that someone who's spiritual, even if they don't meditate or work with crystals or do any of these things, it means they're willing to evolve. I want to know what your thought is about that. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that's beautiful and completely aligns with me. I don't think... See, we look at everything about, oh, what can I learn? And actually, half of learning, in my opinion, is really unlearning. Everyone already has the answer inside of them. You're not really learning anything new. You're just trying to get rid of all the bad lessons you learned. And everyone has that. So it's not so much about like, oh, is this person going from here to here? It's not really that. It's like, is someone going from here to here? And for me, one of the ways I've always thought about it is you can't take the world further than where you visited internally. So... For me, every person that we're meeting already has that journey right there. And all you're asking them to do is look inwards as opposed to outwards. So no, I, I completely agree with you. And I think that's a beautiful point that you've shared. And I think it's something nice for us to know so that we don't judge and label people. We don't walk around and think, oh, those are spiritual people. Those are not spiritual people. Because yeah, we're all. We're all spiritual people. And it's just that some are covered. It's like the sun's always out but often it's covered with the clouds, rarely here, a bit more lately. But some, it's, the sun is always out. It's just get covered by the clouds, and that's us. We've just been covered. And we get covered by those clouds, and they cloud our identity, they cloud our perception. And so all we're doing for ourselves and others is clearing out the clouds. And the more we do that for ourselves, the more we can do it for others, and the more we do it for others, the more we do it for ourselves. Rule number eight, don't judge the moment. In 2016, I moved out to New York. So just let me paint a picture of 2016. I moved three jobs. I got married. Wow. I moved country. And I just, just started a whole new life. Like my life just transformed. So we went through all of that with my wife yes. in one year. And by the way, all of that was surprises. The job change was surprises. Yeah. The country change was a surprise. The marriage was not a surprise. We planned right, that. Right, 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 right. But apart from everything else, everything was a surprise. Now I said I like surprises, so I can roll with it. But my point is that's a lot of transition in a so year. So much transition. And I felt the burden of being in a new city where we had no family, we had no friends. And my wife who loves being around her family and no one understands just how close she is to them. I felt this burden on me that I had taken away her time with her mm. family and now she was alone. So I was going out to work and she'd be crying at home. Mm. And I was thinking, she's got no friends, she's got no support. And I know you can relate to this yes. with moving it's and relationships lot, and so much going on. And so it's like, I'm dealing with that. And guess what, six months later, I have to leave and move on and work on a new career to build everything myself. And then I'm four months away from being broke. And so on top of all of this, I've now got four months away from being broke. I've got enough money, money saved for four months to pay for rent and groceries and in that's New York it. City. In New yeah. York City, and that's <laughs> it. And guess what, even on top of that, I've got 30 days before my visa runs out and I'm kicked out of the country, so I can't even live here anymore. So not only have I just got married, moved job three times, changed career again, had to move into a apartment, four months of being broke, and I might get kicked out in 30 days, and my renewal for my visa cost $15,000. Oh. So that's gonna eat into those four months. I have probably never been 
under that much emotional, yeah. physical, and, and mental pressure in my life. Like genuinely, I felt it. And I felt my body change. My, my breath was more stressed. I would be breathing faster, shorter, shorter breaths, not deep breaths, heart beating not faster, out. not working out. You get into lazy habits, you start craving junk food. Sugar, you have energy. I'm yeah. living in a 500 square foot apartment with my wife, which is, which is tiny, like everything's in that space. And guess what, we both work from home. So I'm now sitting at a desk, hunched over, trying to figure stuff out. She's trying to cook in the same room. Like I'm trying to, just, just trying to figure out what to do. And I remember the next morning, sending like a hundred emails to people and just being like, this is who I am, this is what I can do, how can we serve? And that was the same year that I ended up meeting you later yeah. in that year. Mm -hmm. And the beginning three months of that journey was so stressful, like they were so stressful because I was like, what if I have to move back to London? What am I gonna say to her parents? I mean, I just took their daughter away. Like, uh, <laughs> just I've, got married. I've yeah. lived in New York City for six months, and my life's falling apart. Like, you know, so much, and I've got all these views, but there's nothing. There's nothing mm. happening. And we met. But you also, you also. I mean, at this time, you're also growing so much. How are you able to create and reach this impact with your videos? Yeah. That's growing while you're under so much stress and uncertainty. And I stopped a bit at that time, like things slowed remember, down hard, like things slowed down. I remember that. I, I wasn't creating as much as I was because I don't enjoy creating from stress or pressure, and I don't think you can really create something from stress and pressure, so we really slowed down at that time. And when I was creating, I was creating from a place of recognizing that I could share what I had learned and what I had grown in so far. So anything I was sharing was like, this is what I've learned so far. So that was the biggest pain that I've been through in the last seven years, wow. for sure. And all I can say is that I remember coming home to my wife knowing that this was gonna be the truth. And I came home and I said to her, I said to her, I guarantee you, this is gonna be the best thing that ever happened to us. What, the pain? The pain. I said that to her the night I came home wow. and then she gave up to that. I literally came home, I looked her in the eyes and go, this is the scenario. And I just want you to know that I guarantee to you this is the best thing that's ever gonna happen to us. And I said to her, and this is, this is a monk statement that we used to repeat, I said to her, I'm just not gonna judge the moment. Don't judge the moment, because what we do is we try to label moments as good or bad. And when you label a moment as bad, it now does not have the opportunity to become good. I'll give an example, if I go, I don't like this book, this book's bad, right? And I don't, and I love this book. But if I say that, sure. guess what? I will never pick it up and recognize the value that's mm. inside of it because you've labeled it. Yes. And we label stuff, like we label, oh, that restaurant's bad. Mm. But when you label a that moment, person's bad that now. person's bad. Now you can't learn from that person. Oh, a great one, that's a really good one. Mm. As soon as you start labeling people or anything as good or bad, you limit it. You stop it from being something else. And here's the truth, every moment can evolve into being anything if you give it the opportunity to. Right. But as soon as you say it's got no value anymore, you lose it. And so for me, I had to say to myself, don't judge the moment. And I'd keep repeating that don't to myself. Don't judge where you're at. Don't judge What's this. What's happening. Yeah, don't judge it as negative. Don't, don't just start saying it's negative. Because guess what, we've all been in positions where a gift turned into a curse and a curse turned into a That's gift. That's true. Right? We've also Where our been dreams came through and it ended up not being what we wanted. Exactly. And it fell apart and it led us into the, our dreams. Totally. Why is it that so many people that win the lottery yeah. go broke? Yeah. Gifts can turn into curses That's too. True. But because we label them as the best moment in our life or the worst moment in our life. Whereas when you approach things to neutrality and just what you have on the table, you can be like, okay, what am I going to do next? Rule number nine, train your mind. The way to live your life in such a way that there's no cause for envy is that you've completely trained your mind to be under control of your intelligence and pure consciousness. You're actually able to guide it. Now, that will never be a 100% foolproof plan, right? It will fall apart. And that's where the only way to do it is to be able to substitute or train the thoughts of the mind every time it goes off to feel envious. Hence, start with compassion, then lead with gratitude. When you become grateful for what you have, you won't become envious for other people's. I would put this quote out on social media for this session that envy is the art of counting others' blessings and not your own. So when we're in that habit of gratitude, of counting our blessings, of focusing on what's really working for us, that is where we need to start. And rule number 10, the last one before a very special bonus clip is take responsibility. How have you related to deep spiritual learnings? and at the same time being happy and content in the material world without going crazy? <laughs> Interesting question. 
I think that's this point of spiritual training. So it's like when we're, when we're immature in our spiritual learning, we're just starting out. When you first learn the first, everyone remember the first time they learned something? And they're like, I'm never talking to my family ever again, right? It's like, because you, you learn a little bit and you go, oh my God, I've been doing it all wrong. And now I can't talk to that person. I can't ever go to that event again. And you start making all these big decisions based on something small that you've learned. And so I think in the beginning of our lives, because to protect ourselves, which is a very normal desire and very good and very human, we think, okay, I need to take care of this, so now I'm going to shut out from all of this. But as we grow, we realize we can give more back. And so one of the ways I've always thought about it is, if you look at the ocean and you see someone drowning, you want to help them. But if you go in too soon and you're not strong enough, it's likely that you're going to get pulled in. And at that point, it's easier to shout out to a lifeguard who can come along, who's trained, who's disciplined, who's committed, who can go and make a difference. And so for me in my life, I'm always looking at if I can't bring someone up, I'm not going to spend time with them if they're going to pull me down. And it's drawing that line for me. So if I've been ever scared about my spirituality, rather than putting them down and going, oh, I'm not spending time with them because I'm putting them down, if I can't lift them up, then I'm going to protect myself by not being dragged down. But if I can pull them up, if I can lift them up, then that's when I'm able to go into that space and make an impact and make a difference. And that line has really helped me not go crazy because now I'm not doing it based on a judgment of them. I'm reflecting on my own abilities and flaws and, and the difference I can make. And I'm taking a, taking a stance. It's like someone asked me the other day, what is a complaint? And we were talking about litter. A complaint is you see a piece of trash on the floor and you go, oh, LA is so dirty. You've removed the agency that you can have an impact on that. A statement is, oh, LA's a bit dirty, there's trash on the floor, I'm gonna pick that up and throw it away. Right? Taking that responsibility. So when we're irresponsible in our spiritual lives, we judge everyone and judge everything. And we mature, we start looking at it through compassion, empathy, and connection, and recognize we were just there a few years ago. And that's the biggest anchor in my life, is recognizing that I was addicted to, and still am in different ways, things that I don't believe are good for me spiritually, and I was, that, I was that guy, I was that kid, you know? And it's taken a journey, and someone had to believe in me, someone had to invest in me, someone had to reach their hand without being forced in and pull me out. And so that allows me to continue to operate in the world. I hope that answers your question. Now I've got a special bonus clip that I think you're gonna enjoy. But before that, it's time for the question of the day. I wanna know what was your single biggest takeaway from this video and what is your plan of action that you're going to execute this week to make some immediate momentum happen? When you just get motivated and watch a video, you have a 35% chance of following through. That's what the science says. But when you write down what time, what day, what place you're actually going to execute, when you create the plan, you have a 91% chance of following through and I want that for you. And when you commit to people publicly, you increase your chances even more of actually doing it. So I want to know what your single biggest takeaway from this video was and your specific plan of action to actually get the result you're after. Let me know, put it down in the comments below because I want to celebrate you. I used to have a coach and I think a lot of coaches use this or at least he used to say to us, he would be like, if you, if you lose, cry for a day. And if you celebrate, if you win, celebrate, celebrate for a day. Yeah, that's it. And man. then move on the move next on. day, get back to training. Don't, don't let it don't run. Don't live in the past. Don't much. live in the past. And what we do is when we lose, we cry for a month. And when we win, we just move on. Yeah. Which means that our negative experiences hold us back and weigh us down more than our positive experiences. So, true. so we're actually allowing, because we don't immerse ourselves in winning and growth, we only submerge ourselves in negative experiences. Yeah, we need to celebrate also. We try to celebrate. I've been, uh, you know, that's been part of my life as well, is like moving on too quick. And now Dude, we try to too. like, let's enjoy, let's go to lunch or dinner and really like appreciate this moment and celebrate this moment and even have a dinner with some friends and family. Totally. Otherwise, what are we working so hard for? 100%. And, and we almost feel like we can't, we can't do that because that makes us complacent. Right. But, but that's my point. It's never if you, good enough. Exactly. But if you win, celebrate for a day. If you lose, cry for a day, move on.
If you want to change your life in the next 30 days for free, check out my training right here below. Or if you want 10 more awesome rules from Jay Shetty, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy them. Continue to believe and I'll see you there.